to turn to here all alone wondering why I am where do I go when I need familiar woman hold my hand woman hold my hand who do I lean on when my legs get shaky eyes cloud over I can't see my way who lets me know that I'm still walking upright woman hold my hand woman hold my hand who laughs with me when I'm feeling silly? Who skips a long dance the whole night away? Who smiles with me in my moment of victory? Woman, hold my hand. Woman, hold my hand. Who binds my wounds when I'm bruised and battered By strangers and those daily walking in my life Who lets me know that I'm more than my hurtings Woman, hold my hand Woman, hold my hand cries with me when I lose my baby by accident choice or against my will who knows that I am a childless mother woman hold my hand woman hold my me sing when my voice is silent songs have left me for places unheard who bids me sing when all singing seems useless woman hold my hand woman hold my hand The next song is called Nacola de Serra, In the Lap of the Mountains by Elizabeth Campos, uh, music by Maria de Paz and text by Maria de Paz. It's about land at home, living in a beautiful place in the mountains uh, with love and so on and on. And then one day war comes to the land. <laughs> Uma mulher 
our next song is a song of love and remembering uh, from Bosnia and its traditional Sevta songs. Oi Bosanske Gore snežene se vdalinko puna čežnje o tebi su Thank you. Our next piece is a piece from Cambodia, a traditional Apsara dance. Thank you. 
you. And now we'll be starting with our final piece, uh, which is a montage of uh, the Jai Jagat Yatra, which happened in India and traveled from India to Armenia. And some images from the cartoon contest that we had held, where we have some cartoons for peace. Thank you. Gandhi Thank you. Handing over to the panelists. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Jai Jagat 2020 panel discussion, Peace Building Through Exhibits, the Arts and Artifacts. My name is Catherine Winkler, and I'm a teacher and member of Nova Scotia Voice of Women for Peace, a feminist organization in Canada. I am delighted to co-host today's discussions with Goharik Tigranian. I begin with the land acknowledgement as, as is the custom here. I acknowledge that I am in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the 1725 treaties of peace and friendship that did not surrender the lands or resources. This acknowledgement of indigenous land draws attention to the complex histories of colonization, slavery, 
and oppression. Museums have played a role in representation and as cultural spaces in these histories. This series, hosted in Mother India, is fourth in an eight-part series. We are halfway to the culminating gathering, July 4th, a session in nonviolent leadership. Peace Building Through Exhibits the Arts and Artifacts explores how the public can learn about peace and justice. The broader topic of the essential role that all forms of creative expression play is the backdrop for this discussion. Each visual piece in the introductory digital exhibit slideshow is a footstep in the Jai Jagat March, which continues and will continue in many forms. A special thanks to my favorite Indian artist, Vikram Nayak, for curating. Our topic explores exhibitions and museum spaces in areas of gender, poverty, genocide, and peace. Peace activism flourishes with song, film, theater, dance, slogans, and performance. So does war. Thank you to the Jai Jagat support team, Ria, Janma J, and Gadi, and the panelists, and of course, Jilbai and Rajaji. From Bhopal, Gwalior, Bengaluru, we will try to out woman maneuver any connectivity issues. Our session today is two hours with musical interlude. The first hour begins now with an icebreaker. So I would like to start with Gabi. And uh, these are one minute responses by our panelists. And the question, Gabi, is what comes to your mind when you hear the word museum? Hello, everybody. Yes, museum for me is joy, is memory, is pain, is work, is education. And uh, I like to have museums and I like that they are open again now in our country. Thank you very much, Gabi. 35 seconds. <laughs> I have to reset my clock. <laughs> I don't click. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Shivani. Hi. Good hi. Morning. Yeah. Hi. I am Shivani from India. Uh, for me, museums is a building where people visit to view work of arts or objects of interest from science to history to other tribals and then understand the concept behind it. Thank Great, you. thank you so much. Thank you, Shibani. Alma, what comes to your mind when you hear the word museum? If I would have to say it in one word, it would be a dream job. But I'm lucky that I can say a that dream I- job. That, well, what if you yeah. had a whole minute to talk about it? <laughs> but I, I'll explain because I live that dream job. <laughs> At the moment when I realized what's the potential of museums. So not being only physical spaces with some physical objects, witnessing the history and the past, but uh, ability and potential of what you can do with these objects and stories from the museum, and especially what you can see in society uh, as vulnerable as Bosnian society is all the potential that you can do for education, for entertainment, for dealing with the past and all the all other activities and all other things that you can do with this physical space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alma. And now, so Thierry, your turn. Can you please tell us what comes to your mind when you hear the word museum? Uh, when I hear the word museums, uh, what comes into my mind is stories, which is uh, being the heard and unheard story, and also the memory, the memory that is um, emotions uh, in there, and also the learning. Yeah. That's I have great. to admit Thank that. I have to admit that my background is Gaak because uh, here I'm in Cambodia and unfortunately just uh, 30 minutes ago, the power cut. <laughs> and, and do you want to share how you are lighting up your world right now? Are you still using the, the, the candles? I, I'm, using, I'm using the candle. <laughs> <laughs> I was struggling. I, even, I, I could not even find the, the, the lighter. So I just called my neighbor. I said, can I have two, uh, one lighter so I can, uh, I, I can uh, candle? And then 
but I find this um that's nice because I connect to people rather than just sitting the whole day at home at work. But to connection, I'm happy to connect with you with the candlelight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and peace um, is always possible. Peace talk is always possible. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Shibani? I've already spoken. Okay. Yes, I was just, thank you. And Fran last. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, I'm from the UK and I discovered uh, museum education quite late in my career. And it has been some of the most revelatory approach to thinking about really our society and how things happen and how people kind of can interpret what they're doing, um, how they fit um, into society as well. So I think though museums also have this other side, there's a great joy to being there, there's great safety, but there's also about hierarchy, who actually controls everything and, and where the funding comes from, who decides to fund all this and who, who has the decision-making in it as well, something I'm very interested in. So that's it. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to briefly outline how the panel will proceed. The first hour session will be um, question, uh, we, will be the uh, introduction by Goharik and with your bi biographies, and then you will do your presentations. And the second half will be a round robin of questions. Thank you. And I will be playing the role of the timer. <laughs> Any questions before we continue? So I'll pass it over to Goharik, please. Thank you, Catherine. And I would like to thank to all our panelists and uh, people who are here for this discussion and attend this discussion. I'm Goharik, I'm from Armenia. I am a trainer on human rights and active citizenship in Armenia, and I'm doing my uh, work in the regions of Armenia. So we will go with this first round. And as already uh, Catherine told, we are going to have presentations from our uh, panelists. So our very first panelist is uh, Gabrielle Franger from Germany. She is a co-founder of the Association uh, of Women in One World Center for Intercultural Research on Women's Everyday Lives in International Exchange in Nuremberg uh, and curator at the Museum of Women's Cultures uh, Regional, Inter um, Inter Regional International in Third Germany. And uh, she is actually a professor em em emerita uh, teaching perspectives of international social work and art. So, uh, Gabriel, the floor is yours, and Catherine will um, keep the time. Thank you, Goharik, for the friendly introduction. And first of all, I also have to thank uh, Jai Jagat for inviting me to this uh, panel. Women in One World, the association that runs the Museum of Women's Cultures Regional International was founded in 1989 by researchers, artists and educators of different native languages as an interdisciplinary forum for cross-cultural studies and international solidarity. With our exhibitions and since 2006 with our museum, we offer a space for dialogue with the aim of initiating intercultural and transcultural get-togethers. The Museum Women's Cultures Regional International gives women a voice, a face, and a lively forum. We show the merits of women, their often forgotten activities, how they are confronting regional and global conflicts, acts of injustice and discrimination, and how they promote peaceful development. We create a space for dialogue, but do not provide defin definite answers. We suggest way to think about. The communication process is a permanent crossover of direct and virtual dialogues with women from different periods and different regions of the world with the aim of discussing the structures behind experiences of injustice here and there. How can we find resources for mutual support? How could we build the one world in which we live and which we want to preserve? How can we communicate in this 
this uh, purposes in a comprehensible, tangible and appealing way. Uh, please show the first uh, image. Uh, these these uh, three scenes are examples uh, for different types of encounters we provide. Um, above you see Aymara farmer women from Peru they are exploring the life of farmer women in Franconia in Germany. Then you see a Zahaurian activist. She gives her testimony on an anti-war banner in a conference about strategies against war, which she organized, organized already in 1991 with women from 34 countries. And the other picture is in our museum in 2019 where we displaced an embroidery of the Philippine comfort woman, Remedios Felias, who told stitch by stitch what happened to her during the Japanese occupation in the Second World War. Two students are interviewing our colleague from the Tokyo Women's Active Museum on war and peace. Next image, please. We look for key situations in which women activists and women movements confront repression that could serve as examples for all of us and help not to lose courage. So in our exhibition in 2015, War Socks and Peacemaker Women. In the spring of 1915, nine months after the beginning of the Great War, pacifists, feminists from United States, neutral countries and all countries involved in the war met in the Hague to stop the war. You see the big uh, images of this conference. They developed programs for peace. Their voices were not heard. At that time and until today, women's voices are hardly heard in peace processes. But the banners we placed on this uh, peace table show, show women's initiatives for peace all over the world since 1915. And they are really many. And the women of our conference in 1991 symbolically take part through their voices on the banner behind the granny who is uh, holding the peace banner. Next uh, image, please. One important dimension of dialogue is the relation between feminist visual arts and the so-called popular art or handicraft emerging out of traditional women's occupations, as well as the discourse about female art forms and their subversive potential. The testimony in clay of Rosalia Tineo from Ayacucho about the suffering of her fam family during the civil war communi communicates uh, with a wedding dress out of 5,000 plastic soldiers a work of Anja Sonnenburg, a German artist. Both from very different cultures and societies, but both they, they can communicate uh, about what is happening. Next picture. Next image, please. Since our foundation, we have worked with textile art and studies its, studied its role in social and political movements. Needlework, such as embroidery or quilts, do not only unfold unexpected, uh, unexpected aesthetical enjoyment, but also show specific ways of describing and reflecting women's everyday lives, personal experience, suffering and resistance. In all times and cultures, women expressed through spinning, weaving, sewing or embroidering what they were not able to put into words. This Rapiera from Peru talks about an anti-war action of feminist activists in Lima in 1987. Next image, please. Here we expose handkerchiefs with disturbing testimonies from the movement, one handkerchief for each victim in Mexico. Mainly women and some men are stitching in public places the story of disappeared and murdered persons against the neglect, the fear and the silence. These testimonies in the museum motivate to talk about apparently distant 
and mainly unknown conflicts. At the same time, embroidery workshops can serve as starting points to reflect complicated situation in different parts of the world. The image on the right is from a workshop we directed, for example, in Turkey. The next image, please. We founded our association, Women in One World, to overcome borders and to contribute to the intercultural dialogue to reject hate against migrants and refugees in our society. This is a situation still exists and we always look for ways to talk about. In our 2015 exhibition on war and peace, we displayed an original Afghan rock with weapons from the 1980s. And one of our women, uh, um, Freya Philipp, she transferred some images into fabric and with German and refugee women, they built a new a, a quilt, they constructed a quilt where they uh, said all together no to the war. And this process of creating as well as the presentation led to many emotive encounters. Next, please. Next image. The presentation in our museum and in others here in the Women's Museum in Mexico City as a piece of art and testimony is important on different levels as process for mutual understanding of the directly involved persons as empowering process to find the own work and voice worth to be exposed in a museum and the art piece as starting points for dialogues with visitors in our museum. Next, uh, next image, please. And in 2019, we continued this uh, process with some women who participated already in 2015 in the quilt, we say no to the war, and with some new women and these uh, ref refugee women from 2015, we gather, they gathered in uh, our museum to look for something they could agree to. Now they said yes. The last image, please change, yes. Uh, maybe this, I can resume um, our approach with this last image from our 2019 exhibition, Retrospective Back to the Future, 1989, 2019, 2030. It is a tifai fai, it's a piece of the everyday life of a woman in Bora Bora in Polynesia. This one was, was transformed by Mary Mason to accuse the dying of the Pahua Coral in 1995 for our exhibition, The Art of Survival. And now it is a starting point for educational processes for sustainable development with children. And now to listen to their voices and their needs. That's for the moment. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you, Gabby. And our second uh, panelist and our second presenter is uh, Shaban Shibani Ghosh from India. Uh, she is an entrepreneur uh, from Hurt. Shabani is a co-founder of Para, um, Parvarish, uh, the, mu the museum school. After uh, graduating and doing her bachelor and master, she started a museum-based school to teach underprivileged children through museum e um, exhibits in the year 2005. Uh, she started uh, her journey with 40 uh, children and then now more than 4,500 children have benefited from this initiative of her. Uh, she also received many awards out of which the project the Museum School won the UNESCO Asia Pacific Education Innovation Award in 2016. Shabani, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction. And good evening, everyone. And uh, museum school journey. So the museum school journey began in the year 2005, 5th of September. Me and my partner thought of doing something different for those who are deprived of quality education. So we started the journey with those children who are the most vulnerable in uh, in, in, in the most vulnerable slums. 
so what we did was that we did a survey uh, we went to that slums uh, and when we went to visit the slums and did the survey we found the children are are totally into different violence so it was so difficult to make them convince them to come and have some education and come out from the slums and get some education it was difficult for us to convince them so what we did was that we spoke to their parents they were the rag picker uh, children so their their occupation was rag picking so we spoke to their parents we asked them that if we take the children out from the slums we are not stopping them from any work but we will take them out from the slums take them to a different world where the children will have a different life and they will at least see a different life rather than uh, that abusive languages every day in that slums and every, all, all bad all bad things so parents were convinced only because uh we are not taking them out from any work so we we uh, started this journey and uh, we kept the timings accordingly because we uh, since the children used to go for the rag picking in the morning hours so we kept the timing for the medium school in the afternoon so the children uh, we started and the children started coming along with us uh the first day when we took the children to the museum for them it was a different altogether a different world because for them uh, it was not even uh, the in the in the same city they were just asking are this in the same city where we belong so that that, that is how the changes uh, started in them not on the first day but yes that is how the changes uh, began so uh, from there uh, the the problem with the parents were that they were not convinced because we were taking out the children from the slums so they thought uh, maybe the organization is taking them for some uh, bad uh, intention or or they might uh, engage them in some bad uh, some some different work so what we did was that we asked the parents also why don't you also come for a day or two or for a week and see what we do and where do we take the children to so uh, some parents uh, they got convinced and they uh, they uh, boarded uh, the bus along with us and they also came and saw and for them also it's a different world so the change began from the violence the change began from there so that uh, parents when the parents started uh, uh, experiencing that change in their child uh, it was it was so uh, it was so it, 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 it's a, it's a different world altogether for the entire community over there so these children they started coming to the museums and we never used to teach them through a formal uh, education type so what we did was that we came inside the museums we tell them we we used to tell them uh, go move around in the museum and find find out what interests you so the children used to play with the exhibit different exhibits and they they, they were happy playing with us and then started growing the inquisitiveness the query the questions along with along with uh, the, the, along with their observation so uh, i want just want to share one question uh, which the children uh, the classes were uh, running in the uh, science uh, one of the uh, regional science center here in bhopal and the class was on uh, gravity gravity the gravitational force so since uh, it was uh, we have our volunteers and teachers the trained teachers uh, who used to take the classes so one of the child uh, he uh, the, when the classes the gravitational class was going on the uh, teacher was explaining that earth has its own gravity it pulls everything towards itself the child who has uh, only knows about rag picking and about abusive words and about bad language he stood up and asked that didi uh, you are saying that uh, the earth has its own gravity and it attracts everything towards itself but i have seen the smoke going upwards how is it possible so these these kind of queries this kind of inquisitiveness this kind of uh, uh, the interest uh, when when it started the things from the uh, what they used to go back and have only abusive language and violence in their community has gradually shifted to a better world for them and it become became easy for us to hold these children and make education interesting for them through this museum so we collaborated with five museums and every day these children are been taken to these museums 
and uh, and are being uh, just uh, taught uh, to making the exhibits interesting uh, and um, and and more uh, through observation so uh, janmeshan if you can uh, i can explain more with the uh, images if janmeshan uh, if you can come up with the images so this is how the classes are being done which is one of the museum called tribal museum and see the children how how uh, uh, how happy they are and uh, sitting there and uh, want to learn more and more about the particular exhibit of that museum uh, next so what happens that once the class is uh, being taught by the uh, teachers taken by the teachers the teacher asks the child the student to explain what they have understood from the museum so it why is it being done because when it happens the peer to peer learning becomes more easy because teachers my teachers might be the staff might be explaining in their own language but when it comes to the student when it comes to the child the child explains and tries to uh, communicate with other children in their own language so that becomes more easy to understand if if something is being uh, missed by the teachers next so this is how uh, we we teach them different livelihoods also so that uh, children are uh, engaged in different livelihoods so that if they wish to if they want to when they are out from this project when they are out from this uh, uh, this model they can take these livelihoods as a, as a, uh, they are uh, they can take this livelihood as in in future next so this is how the art class are being uh, conducted for them so everything right so, so to bring the change from violence to a peaceful life everything was being introduced in the museum school next so the, so the clay the clay modeling uh, so they, they used to play with clay so so that they can learn something this is young ones they can learn something and they used to enjoy playing with this clay the so learning uh, in one of the museum the children are learning about different rivers of madhya pradesh so this is how the class becomes interesting and each child they never miss the class they they love they run away from the slums and board our bus to come to museum school this is the kind of change we uh, which we could bring in them next so this is the medicinal uh, plant uh, pl classes uh, so the medicinal plants are being explained by one of the staff next next so this is one of the class in the state museum where the uh, children are uh, so this is one of the class so in the science museum so this is the way the different classes next chalo ja next so this is about one in one of the museums in natural history so children are learning about evolution of man and this is the smiling faces while going back to the home so uh, the the change in them so so the gradually that change in fact uh, in them made us uh we uh, look, look uh, forward in this journey look at the way they are coming this is the first day this is another class next thank you so much so this is how the journey started and uh, you could see the faces of the children when while they used to go back the children who used to come all and all know only the abusive language and when they started coming to museum school the entire community got changed uh, because of them thank you so thank much thank you thank you very much shibani uh, it was amazing and your work is really amazing you, you so are much. changing children's lives and i'll pass the floor to our uh, to our third uh, panelist elma hashim hashim begovic from bosnia herzegovina elma is a historian and museum professional uh, from 2001 she works at the history museum of bosnia herzegovina and from 2013 she is holding the position 
Association of Museum Director. Actually, uh, the new policy of ELMA for the museum is based on the openness building partnership and network, particularly internationally, and creating new museum projects out of which many are exploring the role of museum uh, plays in the contemporary society, mainly in education, dealing with the difficult past and, past and reconciliation. She is actively promoting the museum as a place of a constructive dialogue and a place open to all. So Elma, floor is yours. You have some eight minutes and Catherine will remind you about the time. Okay, I hope I'll not cross this eight minutes. Thank you, Catherine. So next time when you see Catherine <laughs> in the Zoom, we know that it's time to stop. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I think that some things have been said already, what we are doing and who we are and what are our intentions. I mentioned a dream job, so I'll explain you a bit what is the, why I feel my job as a dream job and I, I live it. Here is the, the photo that you can see at the front, as a cover photo, as a really visionary dream job museum. But maybe it used to be like that uh, many years or 70 years ago when it was made and built as a museum of revolution, so museum which was dedicated to the Second World War and to the memory of the World War II. But today, I mean, we, we are living in the post-conflict society, living in the society that suffered atrocity and, and the war and the siege of Sarajevo. So this is the, the photo that you can see. Here is the photo how the museum looked like by being at the front line literally on the first front line. I will not refer to the photos, but as I see them, I can maybe uh, give some, some comments, but the photos will slide randomly and you can get an impression who we are and what we are, what we are doing. Uh, so as I said, we are living at the moment in a post-conflict society 25 years after the war, 25 years after the siege, in a very divided uh, society divided by ethno national lines and the peace that was made and created in 1995 is not the peace uh, we want and exactly at this photo you can see one of the art installations saying this is not my peace because the society is still very much living uh, according to the results of, of the war divided separated having school kids uh, going to separate school etc. The museum itself is also one of the collaterals of the, of the, the post-war situation. Being, being a national institution in the, in the country where nobody wants anything which is national, which is not ethno-nationalized. And it, it, it affects its legal status, meaning that the museum has been left alone but when i say left alone i mean literally left alone even still being a state museum with collections as a, as a real museum as i mean as a, with the building and everything but without really state support in any sense meaning also with financial funding being completely out of our uh, out of our, our loop that means that we are for, for so many years we're struggling in in this kind of a limbo state with a devastated building with uh, no funding for running regular, I mean, museum as a regular one, but, and pointing out that the politicians who were saying, um, who were not doing anything. But at one moment we had a switch in our minds and decided to be more active and more proactive and do the things on our own, seek for the, the support of the society and seek the, uh, the support of building international uh, networks, going out, reaching out further than, than not only locally. And that was the moment when the exhibition that was made eight years after the war about the siege of Sarajevo was created and served as a permanent exhibition showing the objects of the of the siege and being focused on the uh, not only on the, on the atrocities on killing and the tragedy that 
uh, Sarajevo was faced 20, 20 years ago, but showing and putting the focus on creativity of people, showing the focus on art of survival and in fact celebrating life rather than commemorating victims and death. And the whole exhibition is basically made of such, uh, such stories and, and gives such an impression of, of strong, strong uh, will for life and, and for survival. Donated uh, citizens themselves donated the objects to the exhibition. Some of these you, you were seeing at some of the photos around. So with each photo, there is a story that accompanies it, uh, who was made, who made it, when, how it was used. And so the objects themselves are telling the stories of the siege and telling about individual people and individual lives and how they how they struggle throughout the siege. So that was one of the strategies that we applied in the society, which is, as I said, fully divided, which is uh, where each side is blaming the other for for the for for the atrocities, but not being able to see their own uh, role in into in the in the conflict in the war. And that's the strategy that we are in fact applying when talking uh, talking about the war, talking about the atrocities, using very much, uh, in, as I said, individual stories, using very much uh, people's lives, so putting the individual in, in, in front. And that's the way that opens door to more constructive dialogue about the past. That brings us um, more partners, more open space to, to start a dialogue. So we are not blaming anyone. The exhibition itself is not the one which is uh, pointing out at someone and saying, yeah, it's your fault or like it's us, it's them. It's, so it's the exhibition that is that everyone can uh, identify with, seeing the objects and then identify uh, with, the, with the people who, who stand behind the object. Some of the photos that you can see here are also showing some of the activities that we, we do in this, uh, in this, in our program. So I must say that we don't have, as a result of being not funded, so all the projects, all the programs that we create are coming from our own resources, searching for partners, searching for, for people that we can uh, work with in a sense that uh, we offer the space, we are offering our will to, to cooperate and giving our resources and then asking people to, to provide their support. And some, on some of the photos you can see that we work a lot with kids also, as in, in the, as the case that we already heard, but also not talking about, again, atrocities and the very difficult topics or trying to find a way how to deal with difficult topics, but in a much uh, sensitive, sensitive way. And this is when uh, we are putting focus on solidarity, human rights, rights to live, creativity, and on other and universal uh, values in front that pe young people can also identify with or, or can find um, the way to, to compare it with the reality they live. On the photo that we see here uh, at the moment is the photo that when we work with a civilian, uh, with, a, with a community where we took some of the documentary photos made in 1993. For example, uh, when a British photographer documented the crime in one of the small villages in central Bosnia. So we brought the exhibition to the place, but also organized it in Sarajevo. And here you see some of the people who can be seen in the photos and talking to them in, in that way about uh, the life and and I mean, they, are, they share their testimonies of what was uh, going on back then. And the village itself, even it was completely here, you see the, the, the gentleman who, who recognized himself on the, on the photo. So they were very, I mean, it was very difficult for them talking about the traumas and uh, they passed through, but for them, it was very important that someone is interested in it and that we as the museum or taking role in showing it in, in, in Sarajevo also and to the wider audience. So it became more global, it became more uh, wider than, than the local community problem. 
these are some of the activities that we are we try to be uh, where we try to be like current especially with the refugee and migrant crisis in 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 the balkans as you may know there is a, the whole balkan route of of poor people who are searching their better lives uh, in the west but and and crossing the balkans so they were our guests and people of sarajevo for that time for for the time being and they uh, we organized a concert and the exhibition for 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 them to feel uh, welcome here we are coming to the to the last points but th these are some of the activities that you can see how museum is spread spread its activities and its net towards many target groups and um, ah, it's time to say <laughs> to stop but we are also stopping with um, uh, with the slideshow so these i mean i gave a few examples and you've seen on the photos and maybe later in discussion we can also if you've seen something that uh, gets your attention you can ask more but we are trying to be to to survive uh, without any support and to use the freedom that we have that's may, maybe the most important thing that i can conclude with in fact that being out of the system being not supported and being not being not in the mainstream politics how much we can do for society and i mean the price of freedom is lack of funding and uh, care for like some basic things but it gives us a space and makes us happy uh, that we can do something useful for society thank you thank you very much alma and you have mentioned a great point about uh, presenting human rights and universal values to people which is very very important thing in nowadays life and especially in post-conflict countries and states as a representative of armenia i know that so yes yeah, so i'll pass the floor I'll pass the floor to our next speaker, who is from Cambodia, uh, so, uh, Sotiri Yim. She is a clinical psychologist, trauma therapist uh, with uh, 15 years of experience working in social development sector in Cambodia. Uh, she has been socially engaged in voicing our psychology and human rights and the needs of it in Cambodian society uh, throughout his career. Uh, Sotiri has extensive professional experience with survivors of trauma from uh, Khmer Rouge era, including works that uh, focus uh, specifically on the gender-based values. Uh, past and, pre and the present uh, forced marriage survivors experience towards healing. This is the book that uh, she wrote reflecting her work with su uh, survivors of forced marriage. Uh, Sotiri has been awarded the certificate as the peace and conflict consultant from uh, Academia für Conflict Transformation in the Forum Civil Peace Service in Germany. So, Sotiri, the floor is yours. You need to unmute. Please unmute, Sotiri. Okay, now you got me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the introduction was. Um, not mentioning a lot about my artwork, but it will come. <laughs> Thank you. I, I want to first starting a little bit uh, telling uh, why I'm choosing this career a little bit uh, before uh, going a deeper work on arts, but I, I know that I have to manage in eight minutes. I myself um, uh, do not think I am alone can change big things like a psychosocial disease. I call it psychosocial disease. And here I refer to injustice. Um, but I make, a, I make my con, uh, conscious decisions that I am one of the complementary efforts to fight injustice and stimulate transformations. Uh, transformations I refer to individual, family, society, and, and, and the world. That is why my job is always focused on inclusiveness and being inclusive uh, which real voice and stories from community matters. Yeah, I have involved in uh, programs and projects uh, in Cambodia and a few other international countries using arts in conflict transformations. Uh, inclusive here, I refer to being inclusive that creating projects or designing projects that involve victims, survivors, perpetrators, 
uh, that could be individual groups, the leader of the community, or in some to some extent, the government itself are the perpetrators of the crimes or the violence. And the younger generations, I, a lot of our projects never forget younger generations because they are, uh, they do, they did not experience the violence directly, but receiving or suffer con the consequence of the war or the crimes or the violence. And they are also part of uh, um, resolving it. Yeah. Um, I may speak too broad, but let me go to uh, smaller and to specific projects by giving you examples of projects that happen here. We, we did a lot on art base, especially a mobile exhibition, but give, let me give you one of the specific one. Uh, three years ago, um, we implemented projects, uh, uh, we implemented a judicial reparation projects to the tribunal, the tribunal, the special, the hybrid courts of Cambodian in, and internationals to trials, the, uh, the senior leaders and the most responsible uh, uh, who commit the crimes here, who commit, uh, who uh, that mentioned me earlier, that the Khmer Rouge period, which happened here uh, 40 years ago. Uh, it happened um, in 1975 to 1979, uh, almost four years, which uh, killed or which 1.7 million died uh, and many other disappear. Yeah, so we, uh, we, there's a lot of crimes uh, uh, happening there uh, uh, at that time. And one of the, uh, of the crimes uh, uh, is uh, forced marriage. And one of the, one of the elements of the consortiums of that project was the productions of mobile exhibition, I said mobile exhibitions and the intergeneration dialogue. Uh, colleagues here I mentioned a lot on museums and, and exhibitions. And here I, I'll, I'm, I'm, I have my great pleasure to introduce you to our mobile exhibitions and why we do it mobile. The aim of that specific mobile exhibitions for the reparation project, judicial reparation projects is to, trend, to foster uh, transformations in the understanding of uh, sexual and gender-based violence and gender equality through artistic memorialization of the shared experience uh, regarding the forced marriage and other forms of sexual violence under the Khmer Rouge. Second aim of that exhibition is to provide a platform for victims of forced marriage to voice their story, but also their perspective about what lesson can be learned today and in the future. And the third objective of that exhibition was uh, to transform the audience perceptions of victims of forced marriage, of victims of forced marriage, by highlighting the message of resilience as a means to encourage identifications beyond victim to survivor. And this means also empowering. Yeah. Why did we do that? Okay, well, we do concerns about uh, re-traumatizations of our survivor. In this case, collect uh, in this case, we're talking about collective trauma because the crimes, uh, the war, and the crimes happen across the country, so everyone suffer from Khmer Rouge, and and. Of course, we do aware of the re-traumatizations and we do aware of the younger generation, as I mentioned earlier, they did not affect directly, but they, they suffer or they receive the consequence of the war, which is, or including uh, trauma transmissions from the elderly. Uh, in the uh, 2012 Impunity Watch uh, research report noted that uh, Toastland Genocide Museum, uh, one of the uh, museums here in, in Phnom Penh, uh, tended to cause a feeling of overwhelming emotions for young Cambodian, where the museum itself leaked information about why crime happened, which is a primary interest of the younger generations. A lot of younger people that I have talked to during the project, if almost everyone mentioned or ask question to the judge, to the prosecutor, why it happened? 
why it happened this is really the questions that are always addressed by younger generations yeah uh, uh yeah um uh, we learned that okay we learn from we learn from this research uh, and and we learned that the brain the brain and the learning ability limits when we are overwhelming with emotions especially the negative or bad emotions in other words i can say the depictions of hero, uh, horror and pain tend to shut down uh, any other desire to learn and this is why and this is why uh, uh, we create an exhibition that is more interesting and focus on resilience and uh, uh, and so it also allowed dialogue to happen rather than shutting down the learning ability for the younger generations because they are the generations that uh, that we can ensure that the crimes will not uh, uh, repeat hopefully <laughs> and some of the younger generations actually uh, lost interest in learning history oops <laughs> can i have one more yeah lost interest in in learning history i myself did not find myself uh, did not interested in learning history through the narrations of my parents. Okay, can I can I have one more minute just to show a few of the pictures? Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, so please, so please show uh, a few of the pictures. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no apology. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yes, these are uh, uh, some pictures uh, uh, from our exhibition. Just please just uh, go to uh, go to 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 next and uh, you don't need to get my permission <laughs> um i having learned uh, of course having learned from um, the uh, the research and the exposure trips that bring us to bring to to these exhibitions uh the exhibitions that has been very uh made consciously uh, trauma sensitive interactive from our sensitive, interactive, and and uh, ensure the learning component, yeah, and and ensure the learning components to happen. I, very details of the exhibitions product. It's come out of the consultations and an ongoing discussions with experts and the survivors themselves. Uh, and we also include uh, many other components, including uh, psychological support. Uh, information and update from the tribunals from their own lawyers. Uh, we include younger generations in our dialogue. We also, rather than focus on the past, we also have an agenda to talk about the gender uh, in this in the current society, how men how men and women is being treated now, and what what lesson can be learned and what what can we move on move forward, uh, 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 but not living in the past. And every exhibition we made, uh, we did follow with an intergeneration dialogue. The dialogues that bring the younger generation who did not experience with the real, the survivors, uh, um, the survivor to, to exchange an idea. One last word that I want to say here that one of the uh, uh, very inspiring for me in one of the dialogue, uh, younger generations, a few boys and girls here, they said, uh, sexual abuse, rape, let's say that, rapes happen because women did not cover their body. That's why rape happened. That's really surprised for me when I heard this from, from university and high school students, boys and girls. And that time, one of our survivors stood up and said, I was very ugly. I dressed, I, dr I was cut like a mushroom head. I was skinny. I wear black. That's ordered by the Khmer Rouge, but I was raped. This doesn't mean because we are a woman, uh, 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 because we are uh, do not cover our body. It's because we are the woman. It was really empowering us to continue working and creating and continue our dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so three, it was very interesting and the topics that you raise are really interesting and nowadays uh, they are really uh, present. Of course, in Armenia as well, we have the same issues as you already told. And uh, actually with our agenda, we are going to five minutes break and I suggest uh, that we will come back to this, uh, to our last panelist, Fran, uh, after the bre break. If of course Fran is, um, Okay, with that, uh, 
Uh, friend, are you here? I am, yeah. <laughs> we can also delay the break uh, by 10 minutes uh, if you want, uh, because in the flow of introduction, we can have Fran come in, no problem. Okay, so um, Catherine, what do you think, what we should do? What is your suggestion? <laughs> well, we can have a feminist moment and decide together. Fran, would you like to continue? This has been amazing. Do you want to just continue or I'm, would you like to hear it? I'm quite happy to continue because it follows on. It's a very different presentation to other people's. So yeah, okay then. Lovely, so we will continue. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, friend. So I'll introduce you shortly and then I'll pass the floor to you. So Fran has been a freelance uh, artist and an art educator in school and galleries for most of her working life. Uh, she is particularly interested in the ways in which artists express their motivations and thinking through their work mm -hmm. and how people's creativity is activated by talking about and making art. Uh, her involvement with Jay Jagat uh, arises out of a long, uh, lifelong interest in India, where she was born. She coordinated an exhibition in Delhi to highlight Ekta Parishad's uh, Jan Satyagraha in 2012. Uh, Fran is currently collaborating with fellow Jai Jaka 2020 uh, UK uh, supporters on an online exhibition that will explore and share Jai Jaga themes. So dear Fran, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm so pleased to be with people who have used the arts to help discuss and do, and explain and interpret really difficult situations. My own situation is that I live in the UK and we were well, relatively well funded with the arts. Um, and uh, it's, it's such an interesting contrast to what has come before. But what I'd like to do is to discuss how I kind of think about um, arts education and particularly gallery education or museum education and how people get involved with that. So I've chosen pictures that are by um, a documentary photographer, Simon Williams, who's been involved with Jai Jagat for years and years, and um, all taken really about the time of the first massive march that Ekta Parishad did, which was with Jana Desh in 2007. Um, and so I'm going to use the focus photos to discuss how I go about things to engage people with life's issues. Gallery education is incredibly non-threatening and it's very supportive and it starts with questions. Can we have the first slide, please? Here we have an iconic photograph um, and you can see that uh, there's so much effort and determination and barefoot walking and barefoot campaigning here. And um, we use this photograph as um, publicity for the exhibition that was mentioned a little earlier um, to highlight Jan Satyagraha in 2012. Now we took, um, I helped to organize this um, with three artists, Simon Williams, the photographer, Vikram Nayak, whose um, uh, cartoons you saw earlier, and a Swiss artist, Nessa Geshwind. And we, we placed the exhibition in the heart of Delhi, in the Habitat Center, if anybody has been there, it is the most sumptuous and luxurious place, middle-class um, audience, and, and the style we chose was a middle-class presentation as well. So we presented um, issues of land rights, and we had many really interesting discussions from that. People who, one man said, I have no idea how dreadful things are for people. Um, I, being somebody who lived in the town and in urban areas. Slide two, please. Second slide. And then this. What I look for in, in artwork is how the artists can summarize and give, um, give um, a message that is really pertinent and interesting and also upsets things sometimes. So this is uh, really picture as an educator's dream. It's got layers of interpretation, it's colorful, it's very attractive. And people are carrying goods efficiently. There's no fancy luggage at all, but everything is being uh, carried on their, on their heads. There are banners as well. So we know that this is a Jai Jagat um, walk. And then we have a McDonald's crown 
right in the center of the picture. It's an international corporate organization being carried by the people with very few means. Second, the third slide, please. Those and arrows very neatly lined up a display and yet it's very functional. So these are Adivasi tools. These, uh, these are traditional tribal tools. Museums tend to put items behind glass and they say, do not touch, but we need to touch to understand. And some museums, particularly in the UK, have really made an effort to, to get handling objects that can be passed around and discussed. And what something feels like, its weight, its craftsmanship, tends to lead to very much better understanding of very different ways of life with people. So slide four. The museums and the everyday. I really like this photograph. It's an unknown person. He's systematically, very carefully itemizing rice to feed protesters on, um, on the march. It's very undramatic, but it shows the scale and the, the logistics, the planning and the care for supporting nonviolent action. And museums increasingly collect things owned by ordinary people. We've seen examples of this by the earlier speakers. In particular, people's stories. People's stories are a really good focal point for anything that um, we're presenting to the public. Slide five, please. Um, Ekta Parashad has a cultural team. They are an amazing organization of actors, musicians. They present scenarios that are pertinent to everybody's lives. The people that they go and visit, they're pertinent to their lives, such as when land grabbing occurs. And the characters carry the experiences and the emotions of the audience. This leads to discussions of alternative modes of activism. So what is just? What does peace look like? How do you get the community involved? How do you get young people involved? Slide six, please. Slide six. Thank you. So this again is the cultural team, but here they are out on the road. They're part of um, campaigning. They have song, dance, music, they're motivating the marches and they bring communities together. That's the function of artists in this way, bringing communities together and highlighting the reasons for collective action. This is a beautiful photograph. It's really gorgeous. Um, and what I'd like to, part of the, the, the idea of how you, you discuss arts education is that you actually look at the art and how it is constructed. So this, um, in art, there are conventions about the way that structures work, with the way that your eye has to work with artworks. So your eye has to move in certain ways and there are patterns and lines. So within this, we see the, the face of the singer, but there is an arch of arms and hands that frame her and actually make the whole thing come together. So the artwork in our understanding really works very well. Slide seven, please. The seventh slide, thank you. This is the final slide and it's um, an action story, not a, about non-violence um, and pictures tell stories. People are amassed in an orderly way and there's a performance happening and there's a figure of authority. And we know that it's a figure of authority because of the uniform and the gun. And then there's a figure of authenticity. There's a skilled stilt walker with a statement of lived experience. He's actually wearing a statement of his own lived experience or the lived experience of those that are in the crowd. And he stands above the figure of authority and the composition is very interesting, especially where you look at where the figure of authority and the figure of authenticity intersect and the gap between them, the section of sky, you'll see is equal all the way down between them. So where the hat of the figure of authority fits into the banner, 
the top of the banner and where his profile of his stomach goes into the um, banner, it makes a kind of stream between them. And that's where it pulls the whole composition together. And the relationship between the two is questioned. And there are all sorts of things that come up about that. How we deal with authority, how the relationship is between those that are overlooked and those that are accountable to them. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ren. It was very interesting. And uh, I guess we are going to our uh, break and it's going to be for five minutes. Uh, I'll encourage our attendants to continue uh, stay with us because the second round is going to be more of a question and answer style. And I'll pass the floor to Catherine. If you have anything to add, Catherine, if no, then we can go to our break. I am just resting in a state of awe. <laughs> All of you are wonderful. Thank you so much. See you after the break. Thank you. See you. Uh, thank you for the break. We will show you more about Jay Jagat. Uh, this music video that was made of Jay Jagat's journey uh, in Armenia, but also gives a background of the walk that started in 2019, in October 2nd, on October 2nd. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you. So we are coming back, I guess, and uh, our break is over and we are continuing with our second round and I'll pass the floor to Catherine to introduce our second round. Catherine. Thank you very much. I was just going to leave and go for a little walk. I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> so thank you for that film. Jenmi J, it is inspired. It's such an inspiration every time I see it. And um, all of the panelists, I really feel that those stories move us between this amazing resilience and uh, despair. It, uh, it's and, and I think it's, they're sort of collected in that foot that's being bandaged up in the film. You know, we have to keep walking with these, these feet. Anyway, lots of time for reflection after the questions. We're going to do a round robin now of uh, questions for the panelists. And I don't think I'm going to time this. We talked about having roughly uh, a couple of minutes and then we'll go to, that, that's the first part. And the panelists will then ask each other questions and we'll take turns. So I'm going to start, if that's okay with Goharik. Uh, and this question is for sure, Fran. it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Fran, how do the exhibit spaces that you have worked with shine a bright light on the needs of your community, encouraging reflections on peace and justice? So how are visitors encouraged to respond? Thank you. Um. It's interesting about museums. I think you have to look a little bit at the history as well of them because in the UK, the museum started really in about the 1850s. That, um, this is when it was the height of the industrialization and the height of colonialization as well. And really those museums were put together as a way of kind of um, educating people um, off the street um, giving them a wider view on life, but also really it was a celebration of the great and the good. And those that have had lots of power had really good um, collections of artwork and they shared them with the, the, um, the, with the rest of the nation. And yet when we look at how these have been kind of funded, a lot of them was money from slavery, slave trade, so for instance, Tate in the UK, Tate Britain, it started off with Tate who was part of the slave trade and also the slavery of people within the UK itself. So this is something that is, tends to be a little forgotten, uh, but has ha actually reared its head a little bit more recently with Black Lives Matter, a big movement that has happened in the, the, um, in the US and so on. So, the engagement originally is very sort of, um, it's kind of like benefactress, you know, it's somebody who, who has a way of thinking they want to impose it on other people. And with democratization and um, much more people are thinking about the way that the community can come in and actually make a difference to um, to, to discussing themselves and what they do with their lives. So. Um, a lot of local museums in the UK are very much about the identity of the region or the identity of the city that they're in, what actually had happened in the past there. Um, and um, and uh, where I live near Birmingham, there's very good um, uh, uh, structure at the moment for how people can engage. 
Um, but I wanted to just example an organization called in India, which is the Adivasi Academy of Adivasi Voice in Gujarat, which was set up by somebody who's incredibly interested in the, um, the stories, Adivasi stories, tribal stories, and felt that these were likely to be forgotten. And a lot of the museum uh, approach is to in get Adivasis involved in actually collecting and curating their own work um, there and um, supporting the, the uh, culture there. Because there is a feeling that once you start, once you get things into a museum, they become ossified. Nobody can do anything with them except for display them in certain sorts of ways. And so I think you're know, getting people interested in how art is shown, how art is used as a way of thinking about local areas that's really important. Um, and uh, I think for me, I think um, getting people involved is much, a lot about talking. I know we're talking about art, but actually um, art is mediated. We don't understand the arts of other cultures. How can we do that unless we actually understand where the ideas are coming from? And so talking to me is one of the most important aspects of, of understanding art and engaging with art pieces. Um, and I think um, this is where we're, we're kind of going with a lot of things. Um, I'm actually involved at the moment with putting together an exhibition that is, will be online um, in July. Um, every year I go and enjoy myself at a festival called WOMAD. It's in different parts of the world, but it's also in the UK. Um, it's the world of music, art and dance. And um, I help out with a very, quite a big marquee, which is a food place and it's called Madras Cafe. <laughs> and loads of volunteers turn up every year, and 100 or so, and what we do is to raise money for an organisation called Action Village India that I've been involved with for years and years, and one of their partners is Ekta Parishad. So this year what we're going to do is to feature um, the... Uh, we're going to feature Jai Jacket, but of course everything is cancelled. So now, like this setup, we're having to think about how we we display everything online and show it. Um, and so together, this has actually brought us together as an organisation. Madras Cafe, which is volunteers who don't necessarily know a lot about um, what goes on in India, but they're very interested in what's happening. There's Action Village India that has partners in India itself. And then we have a small group that is a support group for um, Jai Jagat in, in the UK. So the three organisations are coming together to actually curate something that will discuss our chosen area. And our chosen area is climate justice with a focus on food because it's a cafe. So we'll be um, looking at how food is grown, um, how the corporates are involved in that as a, opposed to local food growers. We'll also be looking at the rights to seeds and, and how fertilizers are used, who, how is food uh, distributed and what is the security side of things. Um, and um, we also need to look as well at how we, we're developing ourselves as, an, as a little cafe about how we sort we work ethically and organize ourselves in that way so basically we're, we'll have five stages and part of that will be the exhibition where we'll be featuring Jai, Jai, Jai Jacket including a new little game that we've produced called Snakes and Ladders. I don't know if people know Snakes and Ladders at all do they? Because Snakes and Ladders is actually an Indian game. It's all about the ups and downs of life, the virtues and the, and the um, bad things in life, and how you progress from the beginning of the, the game to the end. And along the way, we're using Jai Jagat as an example of how you can move um, from one problem to another and overcome those problems, which is what Jai Jagat has done. Thank you so much, Fran. Thank you so much. Um, let's go on to the second question. Uh, 
that will be sorry uh, is that yeah. Yeah. i was going to have uh a... is that sylvia mm. oh, i'm unmuted can you hear me yes so Thierry, uh, okay. So Thierry, so the question is for you. How does a mobile exhibit work? How does it actually work with the trauma um, and offer a way forward in educating for peace? Okay, thank you. But uh, before before that, I can I have a, a request to all of us? Can, um, I'm afraid I other uh, other the attend attendees of the, of the conference or of this meeting do not understand the word jai jagat. I think uh, in shall we say it in English so everyone who do not speak Hindi <laughs> can understand that too. My understanding is that it means victory for all. Yes, for so everyone. The whole, yes, for that all. Means, yeah. yeah. So that's mean because we, we we mentioned a lot Jai Jagat here, but and I think uh, maybe the word is not uh, uh, here for all. Yeah. Okay. Go to questions. Uh, yeah. When we talk about when we talk about uh, we talk about injustice uh, because we envision peace, and we talk about peace because we believe that peace exists or peace can happen, and a peace that is not just an absence of war, which is uh, perceived wrongly by so many people, but peace is, my country has peace, so you don't need to talk about peace. But peace I meant here is a peace that is an absence of war, uh, a peace or a place where everyone's, uh, 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 everyone's voice heard and being treated equally and feel belong to their community and the society. And for me to be able to talk about sustainable peace, we, me, you, everybody, everyone, every community, every society has to be able to talk about their own wounds. Here, the wounds I mentioned, uh, I, I refer to traumas. I refer to traumas and, and I, when we talk about peace again, I really want uh, to make peace talk simple, but not academy. That, that's, <laughs> if, if we talk peace academically, I, simple people do not uh, uh, understand it and do not, do not take it in, in their everyday life. So a peace that is an absence of war is needed in, in a lot of the society. I, I believe in dialogue. I myself, I believe in dialogue, that dialogue bring, uh, 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 bring out a lot of things, including uh, bring peace. Whether or not the, the small D or the big D, we do dialogue in ourselves. I think Franz mentioned a little bit earlier about speaking to our own selves, Ex uh, apps, exhibitions uh, allow us to speak to our own selves, the community. Yeah, so dialogues uh, in our own self, questioning what happened, questioning what should be next. So dialogues in peers and dialogue in intergenerations. Uh, also for me, dialogue should not only happen in the officials or the government building, but every, every house and every village. And exhibitions that I talked so far that brings that bring out the traumas, bring out the memories, the memory that associates with feelings, sufferings and resilience. Those exhibitions, those mobile exhibitions that, that we produce are tools to initiate dialogue, but not only this, as well as others, artistic initiatives like as film, documentary, songs, poetry, etc. So uh, for me, uh, art, Art's really powerful in, 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 in bring about change. And here it's played the roles in inviting people to speak about it. Uh, let me give you, you a, 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 a short example of, of again, getting back to the exhibitions and the dialogue I, I heard. Sexual gender-based violence is not, is not an easy topic to talk. Mm -hmm. 
so many uh, really hide it. Uh, we heard dialogues among a daughter and a survivors who somehow part of our teams and part of our uh, project uh, uh, of the dancer and the project team. She told us that, you know, when I get back home after the exhibitions and the dance performance, my mother came to me and said, I never tell you about my story, but the dance performance and the exhibitions does tell my story. And this is my story to you as my daughter. Mm. That, was, that was the moment that is so powerful and touching. Uh, that's, that's what I say, it's distance the trauma, distance the traumas, and, and it's allowed people to like re-narrating in, in a beautiful artistic language. And that's very powerful, I mean here. We do mobile exhibitions uh, uh, because dialogue for peace should be happened in, should not just dialogue for peace, uh, uh, should not just happen in the city or town or university, uh, but also in the remote area, especially the place where oppress happen and where less access to services. That's why mobile exhibitions is, uh, is uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's being created and used and touring across the country. Yeah, and you my last, thank you. yeah. I that, that's a, a, a beautiful, beautiful answer to that question and especially the personal story. So we're go on, thank you, so three. Thank you. And our next question is uh, for Elma. And um, the question is, one of the local tours, uh, tours uh, advertises your museum as an introduction to Bosnian war, the siege of Sar uh, Sarajevo, uh, Sniper Ali, and what it mean to, um, meant to survive uh, uh, 1,425 days of siege. Please share your thoughts about how we can educate for peace while exploring military aggression crimes against humanity and civilian devastation. Just turn on your microphone because we cannot hear you. Elma. Here I am. Yes. Sorry. So if I could again get one word to, to explain it, I would say by balancing. But even if you are, I mean, in your question, you are talking, you are addressing several directions that we work uh, in. You have local tours, you also have tourists as a group of people who are coming and want to learn something about uh, the siege and the Boston war and context and, and background of the war. So it's one group that you, you have to, in one way, please this kind of, uh, this kind of audience and their wishes to, to learn more about uh, the recent past and for them apart from from the thing that we would like to to like to share some of the information and and share some uh, knowledge or transfer some knowledge i mean main idea of this of the exhibition what we are doing is to to try to send the message from sarajevo i mean sarajevo during the war and the siege of sarajevo became quite internationally known and Sarajevo became a symbol of, of resilience and, and uh, suffering of civilians uh, during the city and all of their struggles to how to survive the siege. So for us, very important is this dimension of internationalization of the, of the local case in, in two terms. One would be uh, really what Sarajevo as a city and its past can share and can learn or can uh, send as a message to, to the world in terms of peace. But also it's important when talking about the local issues, because I would say that, I mean, here people are trapped into their own boxes of nationalism. And if you are going out a little bit out of the box, you are seen and perceived as, a, as an enemy or I don't know, as an outsider. So if you bring this international dimension, I would say that this this makes us also feel, again, I use the word freedom, but like more free and you, you, you better understand even what happened to people here and you better understand your past. So this is one dimension of this internationalization. 
but we have to please we also have to work on on many other tracks we are working with the local community people who survived or survivors who passed through the war so we have to also be careful and sensitive towards their traumas and like how to you know to re-traumatize it them in the same time we work with the young people who have no ideas but they are living in the post-conflict society and have no idea why they are now uh, suffering of living in in separate communi communities and why they can't really go forward even they have no nothing to do with it i mean that's uh, already like the next generation so i mean balance is the word that I would use and being very sensitive and talking about it yet yeah, because you have and that's why we are very much using I mean we heard from Fran art in dealing with the past and deal and talking with them um, with these topics with the very heavy topics so my question to Fran would be later on how, what are the restrictions and limits of art in in dealing dealing with this because we are really and partly we are doing it also from the um from the lack of historiography or have a lack of narratives that are first of all divided and you have three main street narratives about the war and on the other hand if you want to take some more let's say objective or some more neutral this you can't find it because there is there is not so much written on the topic so you are running in the in the you are escaping basically in the world of art also in in one way i mean when we we as historical museum are expected to work more on the archive material and and facts and you know people are expecting us uh, from us to hear uh -huh, who started the war who what is it you know like all the contexts and backgrounds and that you are not I mean you are, you don't get the instant answers to this and you can't really provide uh, answers like why the war what do we want um, how to reach peace etc so i mean we are in the process of of learning and do i hear myself or someone else stopping me no that's so, fine that's fine Elma, huh? that was i'm i'm gonna jump in there that was a that was great and it's directing us forward a little bit i'm going to just okay. pop in now and for the rest of the time, we had planned that you would ask each other questions. And uh, so Shabani and Gabi haven't uh, spoken in the second round, and I'd like to invite them, if they would like to, to form a question for any of the other panelists. And maybe, Alma, we can get back to that question for Fran then as well that you brought up. Uh -huh, I'll, be, like. I'll be So, um, and, and then if there are questions from the uh, audience, we can also insert those so far. Um, Reva Joshi has asked if some of these very powerful images that you have shared with all of us could be shared. And uh, perhaps we can talk about that at the end or afterwards. I'm... So now if I can pass it on to you, uh, Gabi, to ask a question of another panelist and after you, Shabani, thank you so much. Sorry, you... Your, your microphone is yes, muted, yes, thank I, you. I, I, put a, um, I was thinking about, mm -hmm. uh, again, about the role of art because all our topics and uh, it's uh, Elma, it's uh, Soseri, it's um, our topics most of the people don't want to see in a museum and less in a, in a country like, like ours where these kind of conflicts are very far. Uh, the, these are wars of different peoples. Okay, they they bring us uh, migrants and refugees, but we, in reality, we don't don't want to know too much about uh, the situation. So we always have to try how to connect the situation of local people, not only women, of the local community, to the situation of the uh, women of the families who come to Germany of the situation of indigenous people. We have to talk when we talk about climate crisis and so on. And so our solution is to bring women together to let them talk about their situation and compare the situation. And not only the, the women, the actual women, but only we, we go to the history. 
and we do it through art and we attract the people about through these kind of very interesting art pieces of traditional art or a feminist art and then again talk about topics um, um, in, a, in a different way and so for example in in Bosnia I, I would ask how how do you talk about the violence without showing the presenting the violence without presenting the violence um, but to, to deal with uh, these kind of, of conflicts could can you use art with this uh, yes uh, without talking directly about what the, the both sides uh, what happened to to each other and this because the conflict there is the most recent uh, conflict no, of, of our situations here. And that question is for Elma, Gabi? It's for Elma and maybe for uh, those very uh, two. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the main issue is uh, in it's in fact not having uh, time passed or enough time passed and the, the wounds are still fresh and it's very sensitive to talk about any of the issues. I mean, the first thing that came to my mind when you asked about how to, if it's possible to present and talk about violence and again, use the artistic language. I mean, I can give you an example that we use and you could maybe see it on the photos uh, that, that, that were shown there on the screen, um, that we dealt with a group, the particularly vulnerable group, which is called Forgotten Children. So there are children who, are, who used to be children, but they are now adult, young adults, uh, being, being born after, during the war as victims of war. So being, being victims of, of uh, rape and kids, I mean, today's young adults, as I said, like today, 25, six years uh, old, brave women started talking about the problem and, and created an organization which would gather and invite people to talk about their traumas and finding pe people who are not able. I mean, this is a topic which is not really spoken and it's not easy to talk about it. So one brave lady came up and shared her stories. Yeah, this is exactly the one forgotten children of war. So we found the uh, art as a tool how to address the topic. This is the second part when they when they start talking and this is the, the level two. In fact, first people are uh, faced with the exhibition of their portraits of people hiding their faces or being hidden in the society, invisible, forgotten. And this was the way how to open up the topic. And then the second, when you sensitize or try to send, well, like, to make situation more relaxed in a way, then you start uh, opening up this question as it was a second round of, of direct participants or direct, uh, uh, I mean, people who, who were in charge. So this was one of the, way, this was for us, I would say the most, difficult topic that we ever tackled in the museum talking about violence. So you don't see the violence. These are the children who were, whose mothers were raped and uh, not let be aborted or like mm -hmm. mothers decided willingly or unwillingly to, to give birth to, to those kids. Some of them abandoned them. So some of these people were abandoned and mothers don't want to know anything about uh, them and they, I mean, they live in orphanages or, or, I don't know, they have different destinies. And here we had the case, for example, of one, one, this, this woman that I'm talking about, uh, Aina Yusic, who was the one who started discussion, who was the one who stand up and, and said, yeah, this is my story. And, and in fact, later on, it became even more, um, how to say, used in the art world to the film. It was the film Grbavica that was one of the, the Bosnian film that was internationally known was made after her story. Mm. But here, when you hear the real story, you really face the, 
I mean, how difficult it is to, to talk about it without showing the violence itself, the scenes of violence. This is one example that, I, that came to my mind uh, as, a, Thank you. as an offer, offer to, to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elma. I'm going to go to Shabani or uh, Sotiri. Yes. Can I? And then <laughs> because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, 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 I think it's impossible to not to talk about projects dealing with the past without, without uh, talking about the past, which is itself violence. Um, we, can, we can always talk about the violence, but how? It's a process of how do we talk about it and how do we want to present it? And if we want to do it or show it, how much we want to show it and how much other services provided to to uh, to survivors and the audience, like psycho psychosocial support at the site or in the exhibitions rooms or whatever. It's mm -hmm. it, we have to man uh, uh, we have to navigate, uh, we have to imagine, or so we have to think of what could happen. So uh, we talk about violence, but uh, 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 leave this uh, for discussions, not just show it and yeah, take it for discussions and. And the thing is, when we show about violence or the fact, uh, uh, we should talk about the fact, which is not the rumor or not the exaggerated uh, narration of the history, because history is written by people. So some people, so it's somehow that the, the historians is a bit biased on the history. So balancing, uh, uh, as Alma mentioned, the word balance uh, is, is really important here. And lucky we have here, uh, the crimes uh, happened 30 uh, in the 70s and the tribunals uh, happened 30 years after. Mm -hmm. The tribunal is still exists now, but yeah. it's fading out. But it's 30 years after the, uh, uh, the crimes happened, the, the war happened, as uh, we have it. So it's also an opportunity as a window of opportunity to open up the wounds for, for the whole Cambodian. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, psychosocial aspect, uh, the, ju uh, the judicial and non-judicial work to, to work at the same time uh, for this period. Just one example of, of our exhibitions that we try to sensitize our projects is one of the items in the exhibitions where we want to show the forced marriage, uh, the photo of the forced marriage, which is in uh, dark, black and white. We put it in, in, a, in between a transparent cloth, piece of cloth. So we put our traditional marriage uh, props in front. And as a transparent cloth, we put the image, the picture, the printed picture of the forced marriage, which is sad face. And so it's, it tells us that, it tells the younger generations who learn that, oh, this is our shadow. So there's a lot of way we can express through art, like also the entrance and the exit is really organized or arranged in a very learning and, and trauma sensitive way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Sotiri. And Shabani, thank you. Uh, if you have a question for one of the panelists or if you would like to add, add something from your own experience, I'd like to suggest Get that. To yeah, Kathleen, uh, first of all, I should apologize because I have crossed the time limit while I was explaining uh, my journey of museum school. So oh. I apologize for that. <laughs> and, I, I do not remember this. I don't remember that. <laughs> I also crossed. <laughs> so now my uh, question, I have a very simple question and I think everyone has heard about museum school, uh, although in brief. Uh, my simple question is, how I can learn and can execute all your work in museum school? So very simple question and how I can execute with my children and make it more uh, effective uh, learning to different, uh, the, the you people have got a brilliant uh, ideas. I was just listening to everyone. So how I can uh, learn from you and can, execute in my uh, museum school with my children so that is very simple question 
to all the panelists. All the panelists. And they're and they're all jumping in on this one. Who would like to start? How about you, Fran? <laughs> Who would like to take that question on? Yes, I'm, I'm, this is very interesting stuff. I think actually with, with displays and shows and so on, there is, uh, you can show anything, and, but I think also there is background material that you need for your own kind of um, support for it uh, so that, um, you know, there, there's opportunities to in, in, interpret. I've actually interpreted work without any background information at all. And actually still people get things out of it, which because they try and relate it to themselves. And that's very good. It kind of works that way as well. And, and thank you. I think Shabani that what you have opened us opened up for us is a continuation of this story and this connection. And I really look forward to that. As our last question, I do want to ask uh, Goharik because uh, we haven't heard from her experience in Armenia. And just to talk about um, if there is a developed culture for using a museum for education, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I would start with the words that, uh, yes, Armenia has an ancient uh, history and culture. Uh, but uh, whatever we are doing is the, we are assisting to our past while representing the artifacts or um, whatever is there to our school children. So I have mentioned for me that I have noticed that only in the textbooks there are some artifacts of different historical, uh, I don't know, movements or events that uh, are in place. And what is more important, and uh, our speakers talked, um, touched upon this um, uh, idea, especially Elma, uh, about the conflict that Armenia, it, throughout his, its history, it was in a conflict zone and we had many wars and unfortunately we are now trying to make a war as a hero and what I have, um, the, the, the thing that I would like to mention and I was, I, I was trying to sum up with this and going back to Elma's uh, thoughts is that yes, it's a very important to make make links with the past and history, but it is very important to understand what kind of mistakes we did and we can do this in the museums, historical museums, and we also have many of them, like a history museum, we have some, uh, I don't know, museums of different wars, and I would like to say that instead of showing or presenting these artifacts of different guns, or I don't know, pictures of people who are killing each other, we need to show also and explain to our children the lessons that were learned throughout this history. And instead of uh, spreading and sharing the hatred, we need to educate our children um, and make tolerant and accept others and diversity. This is how, like I would say, that Armenia is not actually in the education of Armenia, both formal and non-formal, is not engaged in, uh, in a museum culture and our teachers are not acquainted with this culture to spend a night or a class in the museum. But if we do this, I have uh, like, um, I, I am worried a bit that we are still going to be stick in the uh, to the textbooks that are sharing and spreading the idea of hatred, and it would be better, of course, to do this like to look at the past, but also go through the lessons learned and go to this artifact uh, with not hatred, but uh, from other perspective, and make our children uh, to develop their analytic, analytical and critical thinking. Besides that, what I would like to say, we also have some museum of our famous poets or writers. Uh, and instead of doing any classes there while showing their real life, um, 
um, experience or uh, showing their lifestyle. We are doing this in the classrooms uh, in a limited box, let's say, and um, it does not give any perception or image of a writer or poet, whatever is there. So I think this is the example of Armenia, even though after the revolution, we have some development. So I guess in your countries, you have the system of free ticket for students. So uh, it's been uh, a year that our students have an opportunity to visit schools for five times uh, throughout the year but uh, again it's just going and uh, watching or looking at the artif artifacts and not talking about it but just looking at it so i would like to say that we need to have and develop another perspective to the museums i guess that's it thank you so much mm -hmm. kohar that's a beautiful way to end mm -hmm. and also with this idea of of hope. I just want to invite if there are any closing remarks we have, I believe we have about uh, two extra minutes. Shabani, you didn't go over your time. <laughs> we have extra time. And I think we need to go over time in this world right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. May I just say very, very simply, uh, Elma, you asked a question earlier about what the limitations of art are. And I think they are limited, but um, what happens, I think, with um, difficult situations is that more artists become more active and more interested, and they never provide answers. They never have the answers to anything at all. But what they do do is present situations that people can think about and can go with. So this is to encourage people to keep creating stuff that is um, pertinent to what they see about them. It is about life, art is about life. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. We'll end our session here. Thank you, we'll just bring in the concluding song to wrap up this, this discussion. Uh, this is a very interesting piece called Phoenix by a band called Jatau, which is a German band. And it's a confluence of uh, one of the newest instruments in the world, that's the hand pan, and one of the oldest instruments, the Aboriginal Australian instrument, uh, didgeridoo, also known as DK. And this is an instrumental piece called Phoenix. Uh, it's a song about resurgence. So we would like to conclude the session with this. Thank you.
थैंक यू जय जगत एवरीवन थैंक यू एवरीवन वी शैल हैव द नेक्स्ट सेशन ऑन ट्वेंटीथ इट वुड बी ऑन लर्निंग पीस थ्रू कम्युनिटी इकोनॉमिक डेवलपमेंट and uh, for now we thank all our panelists for bringing in uh, um perspectives and experiences uh, from across different sectors from showing it was very diverse to see that museums play a big role in not just teaching basic science and maths and geography but also uh, telling about uh, the conflicts that the region has gone through before the conflicts that they are going through now and even how um uh subjects like uh, uh sexual uh, encounters and those can be addressed through museum so it is pretty interesting and very opening for me at least personally thank you so much for that uh yes thank you so much ma yeah. yeah and looking forward to so, joining us for you. the next bye session bye. yeah thank i just you. want to add my thanks to all of you for what a wonderful effort it was highly educational but very comfortable great flow good rhythm and uh, a lot of people were watching and i hope that we can take your me messages and you can build on the work of others that you've heard today and we look forward to our future engagements together jai jagat to everybody jai jagat jai jagat jai jagat jai jagat Okay. I I just want to check I just want to check in how's everybody feeling you've worked hard <laughs> I've, learned, I've learned so much I've learned so much today so yeah it's same here amazing amazing to share yeah really good yeah. same here I've learned I've learned a lot I've learned a lot amazing work everyone is doing yes I'm very happy to to know now each of you I'm very happy to have met you. It feels very hopeful to me to have been here today and I want to thank you so much. Jai Jagat, thank you Jill, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. A special thank thanks to Gary Bhai and Janma Jai for supporting us yes. yes. throughout all our presentations and the pictures and the beautiful music put by uh, Janma Jai. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you everybody. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I I think that was in my closing remarks that I didn't do. <laughs> so that was a really big part. Thank you so Love much you. for all of the work behind the scenes. Thank you. Yeah, all great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 B